we're going to talk about something that uh, Marcy Driscoll refers to as radical behaviorism. There's really not too much radical about behaviorism in, in one sense, but there really is in another. She's, she looks at just kind of hardcore behavioral theory and and what it means to us and how it fits in the range of, of things that we'll consider in this class and throughout your career and, and all of that. So we'll have a good look at it. Now it's, it's taken kind of a bashing over the years. I mean it's, it's everybody's favorite whipping boy is, is, uh, is, is behaviorism because it and, and some people refer to it as a bankrupt theory that it's you know it's they, they almost make fun of it. Um, I don't think it deserves that kind of fate. I, uh, I think what it is is a theory that looks at one aspect of learning in a particularly confined, narrow way. It does a pretty good job of that, but it doesn't, it's inadequate to talk about some of the things that we're concerned about knowing about how people learn now. Um, but in its time, I think it made a strong contribution. And here's the thing. Almost all of us practice behaviorism. Okay? In almost everything we do, in the classroom, with our families, in business, wherever we happen to be, we actually play out um, a behavioral theory in a lot of ways. We actually we actually use the theory, even if we don't call it that, even if we don't acknowledge it, even if we pretend it doesn't exist, we still do it. So it's worth knowing about, it's worth about knowing about in its place, and particularly historically uh, with the evolution of learning theory, it's, it's one of the bedrock pieces. It's one of the pieces that you need to know first before you can really go on and learn all the other stuff that's there. Um, actually, some people say you can just ignore it entirely and we could just leapfrog to where we are now. I think it's a good idea to get a sense of where we've been to see where we're going. And again, this is a theory that hasn't disappeared entirely, particularly in practice. Okay. So, when we talk about um, um, radical behaviorism, one, we're, we're talking about reinforcement theory. In, in one respect, and, and that was created by Skinner in, and really promoted by him in around 1968. Uh, Groper came along later, and uh, 1983 even, was still talking about uh, uh, this and its applications to instructional design and, and to uh, learning generally. Uh, but reinforcement theory essentially just views learning as the formation of stimulus and response associ associations. So uh, you do something and you get a response in return. You set up conditions so that people encounter something and then they respond in a particular way. That's reinforcement theory in a nutshell. Um, so what we usually see then is that Things that follow that kind of a, a, a stimulus response kind of approach dictate learning paths that are really directed toward learning defined objectives. So you know what it is you want and measurable performance criteria so that you keep giving stimuli in particular ways and in particular um, in particular constructions and particular kinds of stimuli uh, that will lead people down a path to a designated place. And you know where that place is before you begin. You know that that's one of the ways that we deviate probably now in learning theory that's, that's matured somewhat and is somewhat in a different direction in that um, a lot of times we don't know where we're going uh, and that there can be multiple outcomes that are equally valued and equally important and celebrated just the same. Not so much with stimulus response and re reinforcement theory. You're after something, you know, there's something you want to see happen and you provide the conditions for that to happen. Okay, these stimulus response associations are formed through conditioning. Okay, and classical conditioning. In, in classical conditioning, you have a neutral stimulus, something that doesn't really have anything to do with the outcome, but 
it's presented contiguously in space and time with something that's known to produce a response, okay? Until that neutral response alone begins to elicit the response. So, um, uh, now we, we, uh, I'll jump ahead, I'll give you an example in just a minute. But um, in operant conditioning then, another kind of conditioning that to build those stimulus response bonds, um, a subject produces a particular response under prescribed conditions before rewards are provided. So you don't give any rewards. You don't let anything, nothing good happens until somebody produce, produces a particular response. And then, and then you reinforce that response. And then you reward the response. You do something that, that says, oh, you just did the right thing. And that response then is uh, built up over time and associated with those rewards. Okay, so uh, let's look at classical conditioning. Um, uh, most famous is Pavlon Pavlovian response um, uh, conditioning, and and that was Pavlov who had a dog and he presented it with a steak. And if you do that, I mean, there's already, this is classical conditioning, so it's known to produce a certain response. And in this case, it was salivation. Like a dog would salivate. No surprise there. But what Pavlov did was he took a neutral stimulus, okay, a bell, and he would ring it each time he presented a steak or a piece of food to the dog. And he repeated that several times. He'd ring the bell, present the steak. Present, ring the bell, present the steak. Okay, then he removed the steak, and here's where the big trick came. He rang the bell, and after that association had been built between the steak and the bell, the neutral stimulus and the active stimulus in this case, then only the bell uh, was rung, and it evoked the same response. The dog would salivate because he'd made that association. The bell was associated with it. Now, no surprise uh, that in opera, uh, that, that we use that kind of thing. That thing kind of thing comes up all the time, okay? Um, let me give you an example. Um, in your own classrooms, you have fire drills, right? And you want the kids to, to behave a particular way. Let's say that they line up the, the, the minute you hear a, uh, 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 a direct order that there's a fire, an indication that there's a fire. The kids know that they're supposed to line up at the door. Uh, one kid's supposed to close all the windows. One's going to, the, probably the teacher closes the door on the way out. All of that kind of thing, right? And they, they're to walk down the hallway in an orderly and quiet fashion and get outside and stand out there a good, you know, good distance away from the building. Now they, they know that and they know to be told that. Like the teacher will stand up and say, it's a fire drill, line up over here off you go. Well, you start pairing that with a neutral stimulus, a particular siren or a particular uh, set of bell, uh, a set of bells that indicate that there could be a fire or a smoke alarm bell. Okay, uh, a smoke alarm bell, fire alarm bell goes off, and the teacher says, "Let's line up at the door, go out in an orderly fashion. You close the windows. You know, all of that kind of stuff happens several times, actually, and we do this repeatedly, don't we? So, teacher gives the condition, the the, the active stimulus, the bell is rung, which is a neutral stimulus, actually, becomes kids are smart. They get it pretty quickly. They get it a lot faster than a dog gets salivating with a steak. They know that when that bell rings, the teacher is going to say, "Line up at the door." That is pairing those stimuli, okay, those stimuli are paired, and so that when uh, the bell goes off, the teacher ultimately wouldn't have to say anything, the kids would line up off, they'd go down the hallway, and that's the hope that everybody would be good, even if the teacher wasn't, wasn't handy. And um, uh, th that kind of uh, uh, thing is a stimulus response association, okay. So when a stim stimulus reliably evokes a response, when you've got it down and it's working, it's said that the response is under stimulus control, okay? But in order for that to happen, whoever, the, the kids or the dogs or the subjects, have to first discriminate the controlling stimulus 
from the competing stimuli and generalize its relevant features to other contexts, right? So if they were in a different classroom or if they were in a, the gymnasium or even if they were outside, they would ultimately, when they hear that bell, they would uh, generalize to other contexts and, and move in that direction, do, do the, the proper response that you're hoping for. Okay. Prompt, there's prompting, cueing, and fading in, 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 uh, in radical behaviorism and, and in uh, reinforcement theory. And that's uh, used to establish the stimulus control. So prompts and cues act to support stimuli which explicitly direct learners to relevant aspects of a lesson. Okay? So prompts, cues, I'm going to prompt you this way, I'm going to cue you to do something, all of that. Uh, pretty easy. Prompting, cueing. But fading happens when the stimulus that evokes the response is gradually removed or reduced so that the behavior continues with res less reliance on reinforcement. So um, ultimately you want in some conditions that everything is removed. Like if you're prompting or cueing people to, let's say, come home, do your homework, right after school and you're reminded and maybe you pair that with a neutral stimulus maybe it's a snack or something like that I mean, you know you can have you can have three cookies and some lemonade if you do your homework right after you come home from school and you sit there and get it done yay um, and so you pair those up and then ultimately what you're hoping is is that you can remove some of those things and the proper behavior that that the, the habitual behavior that's been created will continue without stimulus. Okay? So that happens in particular ways. Um, stimuli presented as a consequence of responses can act as reinforcers if they closely follow a response. So um, uh, let's say let's say you're walking your dog and your dog does a really nice job of something on the walk, uh, his heels as he goes and things like that. And you get back and if you reinforce that right away as they're doing it, then that can reinforce the behavior. The dog knows it's doing the right thing, it reinforces the behavior. Same thing with kids. I mean, uh, you do things right away with them, you say, oh, nice job, pat on the back or you know, some other kind of uh, reward. Uh, and uh, then uh, they're more likely then to, to do the, the thing you want them to do in the first place, okay? Positive and negative reinforcement are, de are designated to increase desired responses. So you might do positive things, you might do negative things, but uh, or use negative reinforcement but they're always designed to increase a, desi a desired response, okay? Not to kill a response, but to reinforce the response, increase the likelihood. And that's an important distinction we're going to come to in just a minute, a difference between negative reinforcement and punishment. Okay, so they, appro they shape appropriate behavior, always going in that direction. It can be positive, it can be a good thing. Um, uh, you, they can, let's say, uh, uh, of, you know, giving snacks to kids or giving them time on their, that they can play games uh, or, or uh, time that they can go outside and, and mess around in the backyard or take off with a friend, go, go uh, on their bike somewhere. All those kinds of things are positive consequences. Happy to do it. I did my homework. I did it well. I did it when I was supposed to and now I can take off and I get a positive reinforcement. But there are also times when you use negative reinforcement. And what that means is, is that there's something bad going on, okay? While, you know, there's something negative. And if you do the right thing, that negative thing, that bad thing stops, okay? So all of a sudden, you know, so it's taking away something, okay? It's removing, uh, it, negative reinforcement means reinf uh, reinforcing by removing or taking away something negative okay and that does the positive thing now let's let's take an example you'll say i'd never do that i'd never do that at all yeah you would <laughs> we've all done these kinds of things but um uh 
let's just say uh, an example is a timeout. Okay? Let's say that you use timeout so kids just having trouble controlling himself. You know that uh, 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 the whole idea here is that you're not going to reinforce that with something positive. He's not doing what you want. You want, you want the kid to settle down or, or behave in a particular way. Um, so what you do is you remove them and you give them a timeout somewhere. And you say, okay, go over here and just let's have a timeout. Let's just go over here and you be on your own for a while and you stay on your own until you're ready to, let's say, rejoin the group and, and behave, be behave better than you are now. Okay? So that's a negative thing. Remove from the group. It's a social punishment in a sense, but it's not really a punishment. What is it? It's just an environmental thing that isn't happy. It's not a good thing. It's good, it's, you know, and and they'd prefer to be with with the group. So they stay over there until they're ready to come back. Okay, and they come back, and you say, okay, re, 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 you can rejoin the group. You seem to be okay now. So the removal of that negative reinforcement. Um, is a result in something positive, them behaving the way you want them to, and their, their ability then to rejoin the group then becomes a positive reinforcement, doesn't it? So you can have positive and negative reinforcements all mixed up in things that, that happen with you. Now, these aren't really the kinds of things we do a whole lot as teachers now, but um, they're they are things that still exist in our environment, don't they? And I mean, I think if you if you think about the premac principle, if you look after reading Driscoll, okay, and that'll be a little thing for you. Read Driscoll. Uh, think about premac. Uh, we all do things, and we employ uh, uh, reinforcement theory quite a bit. So, reinforcement can be of a lot of different types. It can be continuous all the time. I mean, every time somebody does the thing you want them to do, you can reinforce it. Or it can be intermittent. Every now and then, you can do it. Okay? You can do it not every time, but every so often. Now, intermittent reinforcement can be after a fixed or a variable number of responses. So you see them do the right thing three times, you give it to them. Uh, you, then they, it's six times you give it to them, and then the next time you give it to them, and it's just like uh, uh, mixing up things uh, uh, that you might do for other reasons. You do it to keep people a little off balance. They don't know when they're going to be reinforced. You know, it could be three times, could be six. With negative reinforcement, it could be you have to be in timeout as long as I tell you for three minutes and six minutes, or it can be as long as you feel that you need it and when you're ready to come back and join us. So it can be intermittent. We don't know how many times. We don't know when it's coming necessarily or the receiver doesn't. And so it has that effect of keeping them a little off balance but they still know they're going to be reinforced for it or they'll keep trying. Now the other one is a fixed schedule. So that might be like every three times I see the behavior I want, I'll reinforce it. Every five times, I'll reinforce it. Well, um, that can work too, okay? A fixed or a variable, uh, uh, and, and a, 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 a fixed or a variable schedule, okay? Now, it can also be on a ratio schedule or an interval schedule, okay? Um, and that is over time, okay? So, uh, over time it can be a ratio, over time it can be an interval, but both schedules have different effects on how associations are made. Okay, So you can have intermittent reinforcement after a fixed number of responses, a ratio schedule, or after a fixed amount of time, an interval schedule. You know, uh, it can be continuous after each response or intermittent after uh, a period or a number of responses. So those things can be mixed together, and these schedules come together to um, determine how associations are made, how behavior is shaped, and it does affect uh, the durability of conditioned responses. So you're trying to condition, operant conditioning now. We're trying to condition these responses. Also, by the way, um, if you take away the stimuli entirely, 
you know, the reinforcements entirely after a while, you'll see that the variable uh, interval and variable ratio will trail off slower because they don't know when things are coming. They'll it'll be under stimulus control or reinforcement. I, you know, the the uh, the the reinforcement schedule will have worked to maintain the behavior for a longer period of time because they're still hopeful it'll happen sometimes. Okay, sometime. Okay, reinforcement and feedback are often incorrectly considered synonyms. Uh, feedback generally includes information related to the accuracy of a response and has response correction value. So, so you know, you get some feedback, you know what you did wrong, you know what you can do better. So feedback, you can tell people feedback, say, no, I want you to behave a particular way because you were doing this and this is this way and if you behave this way, you'll, you'll be better off. That's feedback. Um, reinforcement may not include information. It's just, way you go. Pat on the back. Yay, I'm so proud of you. A little bit of praise. A little bit of happiness. Um, all those things have uh, no real response correction value in and of themselves. The, the person who you're trying to establish that with is trying to figure all that out. Like, what do I have to do to do it right <laughs> to get what I want? So, um, so feedback and reinforcement are two uh, different notions entirely. Okay. Um, individual stimulus response associations can be linked together to produce networks of stimulus re response chains. Like you can teach somebody one small part of something, teach them another small part of something, and then you can reinforce each of those, you know, separately, but then you can start chaining those and they'll link together rather nicely. Um, uh, Chains provide the behavioral explanation for the ability to perform complex tasks and and solve untaught problems because in behaviorism that just shouldn't happen, should it? I mean, it's a stimulus and a response. But if you do enough of those together, you can be describing a much more complex kind of behavior. It looks more impressive, uh, and and people can actually extrapolate from what they've learned from several stimulus response things and guess about what might happen. Successfully guess when they might be successful with, uh, without any uh, stimulus response association. And from a behavioral point of view, motivation is seen as learners becoming motivated to seek stimuli and make responses leading to positive consequences. And avoiding stimuli and responses that engender negative consequences. So it's I want to do the right thing so I get rewarded. I don't want to do things that get me punished or make me unhappy or that sort of thing. Okay? So you can see why some people don't like the taste, the smell of that kind of thing. It just feels so mechanistic and it is positivistic and and it seems so contrived. Uh, uh, given many of the things that we care about now in describing how learning happens. But you can see that it has its place in understanding how people do behavior and how some of those things uh, are, are brought together. Um, we've, there, there are lots of different kinds of applications I could give the, of radical behaviorism that you've seen. Anytime we're talking, and we this has been you know, really popular language. Again, it seems to come in waves. Um, but objective specification and, and precise instructional expectations expressed as desired behavior. You can see why standardized testing falls into um, uh, this whole camp of things. Imperial testing, constant review and, and revision during uh, lesson development. So if you're reviewing, revising, reviewing, revising, and lesson development, and testing it along the way, you're really looking to see what works, what doesn't work, and trying to make corrections based on that. Uh, Self-pacing. It's a cornerstone of, of gaming, of uh, computer-based instruction. Uh, it's borrowed from a thing called programmed instruction way back when, when it was very, very regimented. But uh, uh, self-pacing is something that we see that's really been an outcome or an application of radical behaviorism. Um, 
Uh, got a list of other things here, uh, overt responding based on interactive systems, immediate feedback that we see in, in classrooms and elsewhere. It's, it's strictly from, not I shouldn't say strictly, not exclusively, but there, there are other modes of thought you could bring to bear on it to do some of these same things, but uh, immediate feedback is obviously built into pairing and stimulus response pairing and all that kind of stuff. Controlled sequencing when you, you're very prescribed in the sequence you're going to follow in certain kinds of things. Certainly that's an example of behaviorism in action. And then anytime we build things in small chunks and step size and if you say okay I'm going to build this lesson in chunks and deal with it and then we'll stick those together well, it sounds a whole lot like stimulus response chaining, doesn't it? Okay. Um, low error rates and paying attention to that. Prompting, screen cues, contextual cues in menus that we see in websites, in databases, uh, uh, in the kinds of prompting that you see in gaming. Um, uh, it's really quite remarkable how heavily that's used and how much gaming borrows from behavioral theory to reinforce the behaviors they want, which is you to stay active in the game. Um, confirmation, knowledge of results, KOR applications. Um, uh, confirmation, knowing how you did, is endemic to the positivist perspective of behaviorism and behavior modification. You've probably heard of that many, many uh, 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 groups of people have been subjected to behavior modification, behavior mod, for all kinds of things, and it has uh, a, a particular stigma attached to it as well. But the point I want to make with this is that the theory alone isn't good or bad. It has application in understanding certain aspects of be behavior and how it's acquired. So when you hear people really slamming behavioral theory, I think they're being premature and maybe a little, maybe a little naive about theory and what it's supposed to accomplish. Behaviorism does what it's supposed to do. It describes, a, uh, it tries to describe a particular subset or small part of learning, small and small aspect of learning. Now it's inadequate. And that's where we're going to go on to other schools of thought, other theoretical schools of thought, uh, to help explain other kinds of things when we look at them. But that's a, uh, have a really good look at the readings and uh, for, for this area, because this is a foundational area. And if you know this, and you probably ran across it a hundred times uh, in your, your uh, pre, your pre-education or your, when you were a teacher candidate um, and even before that in psychology classes and all of that. This is a, a theoretical school of thought that applies to a lot of areas and, and ours is just one of them. So um, uh, we'll leave it at that and next time we'll pick up on a theory that takes it to the next level of understanding.